And uh, my name is my name is Katie Owney. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations at Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Um, welcome everyone to another one of our Howard Center speaker series, um, the one for uh, this spring. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Um, we are gonna be recording this um, and we'll have it up on the college's YouTube channel, um, hopefully by sometime tomorrow. Um, so you're aware of that. Um, we should have time for questions later on. Um, so we encourage you to put those um, into the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, the moderator for our panel, um, Kathy Best, who has been the director of the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism at Merrill College um, for what, almost three years now, Kathy? Three years? Almost, almost three years, yeah. So, um, and Kathy has, has led the center to um, some incredible work, um, and you're going to hear about one of those projects this evening um, from our faculty member, Deb Nelson, and three of our students um, who worked on the project. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kathy. Thanks, Katie. And thank you all for taking time tonight to, uh, to join us to talk about this work. Last year at this time, we were finishing up uh, a, an, an investigative project that eventually um, uh, resulted in five stories. Um, it was a collaboration that the University of Maryland did with uh, journalism students at Boston University and the University of Arkansas. We ended up calling the project Essential and Exposed. And the reason we called it that is that we focused that spring um, on looking at how essential workers in the United States were faring during the height of the pandemic. What we found is that they were not faring that well. Uh, the stories that we did um, looked at essential workers through the lens of Walmart, um, uh, essential workers working behind the scenes at US airports, um, our colleagues at the University of Arkansas looked at how poultry workers were faring in that state, and uh, students at Boston University uh, looked at how overwhelmed the local public health officials were in trying to keep people safe. But the story we're going to tell you about tonight um, was really an extraordinary piece of journalism, thanks to the work of the students and the professor that are gonna be talking to you tonight. It focused on workers who were brought legally from Mexico with H2B visas to work in seafood processing plants up and down the mid-Atlantic. Um, they worked uh, shucking oysters and picking crabs and they worked in shrimp plants. Um, we're gonna tell you why we chose to focus on that. Um, but first, um, Katie, Katie mentioned that uh, Deb Nelson is a professor at the University of Maryland. Deb, um, what she didn't say is that Deb has uh, won one Pulitzer Prize, edited two Pulitzer Prize projects, um, is still doing investigative journalism, working with Reuters, in addition to teaching the next generation of students how to uh, do investigative reporting thoroughly and well. Um, she's joined tonight by three graduate students, um, all of whom we will lose uh, next week, which makes me very, very sad. Um, all are Howard Fellows, which means that they, they work on um, projects in the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. Audit Tombe, it specializes in data journalism and data visualizations. Uh, Vanessa Sanchez, excuse me, is a, is a reporter and a reporter extraordinaire. And um, Trisha Ahmed um, also is a reporter and has worked on multiple projects. So with that said, Deb, why this project? Well, Kathy, um, tell me if I'm remembering wrong. The <laughs> seeds of this project were planted over dinner with one of your old sources. It was True. an expert on worker safety regulations. Kathy dragged me along uh, because she knew I had an inviting interest in worker safety dating all the way back. 
uh, to my earliest days as a reporter. I thought it's about the age of the reporters here. Um, when I investigated OSHA's failure to uh, protect factory workers from exposure to dangerous chemicals, um, Kathy's source expressed grave, grave concern over the agency's failure to take emergency steps to address exposure in the workplace to COVID. The fact of the agency's failure had been reported, but we came out of that meeting thinking it was really important to document the consequences and to hold the agency accountable. So we consulted with the Howard Center Data Director, Sean Mossenden, and he assembled a team to obtain and analyze a national database of OSHA complaints that you'll hear a little bit more about. Um, and we mobilized our media law classes to submit public records requests to uh, for state health department records um, on worker COVID cases. Now, by the time we launched our investigation, a few other news organizations were pursuing the same story. It was a crowded field to say the least, right, Kathy? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they say a great that great reporters zag when everyone else is zigging. And that's what our three reporters here did. Uh, Katie introduced them as students, but when they work for the Howard Center, they are reporters. Um, at one of our early team meetings, Vanessa asked an important question. What about the workers who aren't in the data? The people who are so vulnerable that they won't file a complaint. Let me just say that she made such a compelling case that we assembled a team to pursue her question. And I'm gonna let, I, Kathy, I think we should let her and Tricia and Audit take it from there because Absolutely. this really was their project. Yep. You know, they planned it, executed it, they proposed it, planned it and executed it. So Vanessa, I'll give you one prompt. What, what gave you that idea? <clears throat> Yeah, well, thank you for, for having us. I think it's, it's really a great opportunity to talk about this story that is, I think, really personal for me. Um, before the, we joined this call, I was thinking about this very question that you just asked. And I think that before we started the project, we kind of knew um, that we wanted to look into um, safety protections for essential workers. And I think that at that time, I was already thinking, um, about workers who are vulnerable um, or who are denied um, safety protections during the pandemic, pandemic, but just in general. And at that time, I remember that I was living in one of the zip codes that was a, a hotspot in Baltimore, and it was a community, a primarily Latino community. And I would hear from organizers and just for communities in, in these neighborhoods talking about people getting COVID, essential workers getting COVID, people dying, um, and they were kind of mobilizing resources to help them. So um, before we, when we came to the Howard Center to start this investigation, I was thinking maybe I can bring this very raw idea of what I want to do. And then if they trust this thought, we can make this a story that is really important to, to tell. And it was really interesting because Audit is gonna talk more about this, about the data, but the numbers that we found early on the process didn't reflect what I was hearing and what I was seeing. So I think that it was really, I think, important to look into this disparity and work around the lack of data that we were seeing. And that's how everything started. And initially we wanted to focus on unauthorized workers, but we knew that it was going to be really difficult because we only had four months to work on this investigation. And you know, um, given the, the vulnerability of this population, we would have required more resources, more time, and even data that we knew that we were not going to find. So we kind of pivoted towards other um, populations that included migrant workers, and we focus on H2B migrant workers who, for those who don't know about this program, the U.S. has relied on workers, seasonal workers from 
countries outside of the US to do occupations and to work in industries that normally a US citizen wouldn't do. And many of them come primarily from Mexico every year to, for example, like you said, pick up crop, but they are also landscapers. They are also construction workers. They are also au pairs. They also take care of children. Um, they process the food that we eat and they were getting sick and they were also dying. So that was kind of like the, the start of this investigation. Great. Audit, it did rest though, even though we didn't have perfect data, um, there was a strong data foundation. How did you pull that together? Yeah, um, as Vanessa rightly mentioned, um, this project was a great example of looking, examining data, analyzing it, and asking the question, who's not reflected in this data set? Um, so we primarily used um, federal um, OSHA um, data about COVID-19 complaints. Um, OSHA, from the time the pandemic began, OSHA um, was publishing weekly reports about um, about complaints. Um, so we looked at those, analyzed those, and um, we looked at which industries they were coming from. Um, and an overwhelming number of them seemed to be coming from um, food processing plants. Um, in addition to that, we also looked at H2B data, um, which is published by the Department of Labor um, to see um, um, which industries were requesting um, the most number of, of, of migrant workers from abroad. Um, that data set was particularly rich because um, it had fields such as um, the start and end date of, of, of employees who were requested. Um, it, had field, it had fields for um, the employer who was requesting them. Um, it, had, it even had um, the hours that the workers would have to work in the US, um, which, which, which indicated that it would be particularly helpful for um, the reporting team to pursue those leads. It's great. So once we had this strong data foundation, um, Trisha and Vanessa, how did you find human beings to illustrate it? And especially how, how did you get people who were in very vulnerable positions to trust you enough to tell you their stories? I can start with the data part of that um, where, oh, Sorry, <laughs> I can start with the data part of that, where um, what we did have from the H2B data set that Audit just mentioned was kind of our launching pad into finding sources. Um, because of that spreadsheet, um, we were able to see which specific companies um, or individuals were requesting um, workers and authorizing workers through the H2B program. And we also had their addresses from that data set, which is like a federal database that anyone can access. We had their phone numbers, we had their names. I think we even had their attorney's names. Um, we had so much information. We could even see like how many hours they wanted their workers to work and on which days. So once we were able to identify which um, retailers or which companies um, in the seafood processing world we wanted to focus on, we just showed up in some part. Um, but Vanessa can speak more about um, the extra steps that we took in order to find workers when we found that showing up wasn't enough. Yeah, I think that it was a combination of different strategies. From the start, we knew it was going to be hard. <laughs> um, so I think it was relying heavily on um, organizations, especially migrant, um, yeah, migrant workers rights organizations and just um, communities who were already in contact with them. So there is one organization that gave us access to one worker at the very, very um, early on in the process. And I think that it was really good for the investigation and for the final results to have access to this one worker at the beginning, because we could accompany her uh, throughout the process. Um, this, this person is a worker who was working for a partic particular seafood processing plant in one of the states uh, here in the US for a very long time. Uh, I think 
um, she's been working for around 17 years. So pretty much her entire life dedicated to, to picking crab. And mm -hmm. she um, gave us access and she was sometimes our eyes and ears in places where we couldn't have access to. And particularly because many of these workers at the beginning, they were still in Mexico. So we were actually waiting for them to come and we didn't know what was going to happen. And she was describing, she actually described the process from leaving Mexico City, going to Monterrey, which is the place where they are um, granted visas to enter the, to cross the border and then um, travel to their specific locations where they have to work until they actually arrive to one of the islands. Um, so we follow that process. And then the other, the other I think, the other uh, strategy that we used was community listening. So you know, um, you 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 know that there the, behind many workers there are always networks of people who are willing to help them. And if you identify those networks of people, then you I can guarantee that you're gonna find things that it's impossible to find them otherwise. Um, so we kind of focus a lot of trying to find churches, trying to find organizations, just people who didn't have a relationship with them necessarily, but we're just, we're just part of the network. And that's how we got access to a lot of information that wasn't in any document that at the end, I think um, even at the end when we knew that, for example, the new uh, group of workers got COVID the second time that they came um, from Mexico, the only reason we were the first ones to know that before anybody else. In, not even the Department of Health knew about these cases. And it was because of these networks that we kind of built over the process. And the fact that we had so much time to build this trust, to listen to them, to accompany them, to understand who they are, to let them know who we are, like that really helped um, access a lot of information at the end. How did you overcome the, because there were language issues that you had to overcome as well. How did you do that, um, especially uh, using social media, I think, very effectively? Um, well, it, in, I think for me, it was kind of a really big advantage that I speak Spanish. So <laughs> uh, yes. they, many of, yeah, I would say all the workers, they, the thing is that I think it's really important to understand is that these programs, and especially certain occupations and industries are extremely racialized. So you're gonna find a disproportionate number of these very specific groups. So you're gonna find a disproportionate number of immigrants who are from this specific country. And in the case of seafood processing, what we found is that these group of people were primarily from Mexico, were primarily women, and they have been working in the US for a very long period of time. So we kind of, knew the characteristics of the group that we were going to deal with. And then we kind of tried to find resources around that. And the team, we had uh, Luciana, who is not here, but also um, play an important role in the data analysis. She also mm -hmm. speaks Spanish. So it was really, it was really, and, and Carmen, who also was part of the team, also speaks Spanish. So the three of us and with our bilingual skills kind of com communicated with them. And then the, I think that um, the rest of the team contacted um, organizations who are working on the ground, um, trying to um, advocate for their rights, primarily labor rights. Great. Deb, all of our reporters were, were working remotely um, during this project because of the pandemic. What was that like to manage? Um, it's not ideal. We can't sit down and have a conversation around a table, you know, as people are talking, they can't be shouting out, hey, I got through to this, you know, everything had to be, our, our contacts had to be fairly intentional. So that was difficult. However, I have to say that with this group, um, it didn't feel that much different than a normal investigation. I mean, they were out there in the field reporting. They're communicating with each other. They're, they're cautious, of course, out in the field, taking precautions, mm -hmm. um, staying safe. 
I don't think anybody came back with COVID um, and they were keeping others safe. Uh, the, the thing is I, I, you know, with this group, with this group that you're seeing right here, um, I really didn't have to tell them to stay safe. I didn't have to tell them to keep other people safe. Um, the bigger challenge for all of us was keeping the workers who are vulnerable safe, right? Um, and uh, and so um, they, that was a matter of, of fielding calls, you know, of taking calls from the field. But I've got to say again, in this project, the calls I got from the field when they're out in the field, I was, you know, carried my phone everywhere, ready to talk whenever something came up. Um, uh, the calls from the field um, were, they thought of things that I wouldn't even think of. Um, this, yeah. So I'd say, ask this crew this, what, what difference did it make? You were out there in the field. I was stuck back in the office and separated from everybody, but you were out there in the field working, taking precautions, not just to stay safe in a pandemic, but to keep your workers safe. And I'm really, I think you did that in an amazing way. So I'd love to hear more from you all about that, right. because I'm going to use this recording for future classes. Well, because of the pandemic, I mean, I think the scope of our project was a bit limited. We focused on Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, which are all relatively close by. I mean, they're drivable. And I think that when we decided which states to focus on, it was top of mind of where we, where can we like feasibly go without getting sick ourselves or endangering the people that we're trying to make sure are not getting sick. Um, in an investigation, which is pointing out how they're getting sick. Um, so that was one thing. And another part of it is we couldn't enter their housing. So we would, you know, ask them about what it's like inside of their group housing, what the precautions are like, but it was mandated by our university and by our program that we could not enter indoor spaces um, if we were out in the field. So relying on secondhand information was definitely new. Like we couldn't go in there ourselves and you know take notes or observe things ourselves. We had to get workers to say, you know go into their houses, take a video, have them like walk around, and then hope that they trusted us enough to send us the video or to come back out of their houses and tell us, hey, here's the video. Um, so that those were some challenges of it. But one amazing thing was um, you got you got an in, you actually got to go and see the place you're talking about because you got the one of the people who operated the plant to invite you. Right? How did how did that come about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we had access to um, workers, seafood workers in the three states. Um, what we did is in Maryland, we contacted the owner, the employer of this company, and she gave us access to, initially she said that she would give us access to the plant. So we drove down to the islands in Hooper's Island and we interviewed her and she was describing the, the labor conditions there. And she was, pretty, she was explaining, she was talking about um, all of these work safety violations that she was doing um, as if it wasn't a big deal. And when we kind of follow up with more questions to understand where she was coming from with the answers that he was giving us to our questions, she realized that what she was saying put her um, in a, I don't know, risk position. So then she denied us access to the plant. But nevertheless, we decided to go anyways. We didn't, of course, um, trespass the, the plant at all, but we waited for these workers outside because they have lunch. So when they were, as they were leaving, we, get, um, we got to interview them and just listen to their stories. And in Virginia, that was, I think that was the most challenging one because we didn't have anybody. We didn't have an organization. We didn't have a source. We just went there to find them. And 
uh, we drove down there and then we found a church and then we asked them, do you know where the, because they are called migrant camps are, so do you know where the migrant camps, camps are? And everybody knew where the migrant camps were, so they pointed at the direction and we went and we found them and they were there and they were willing to speak with us and share their stories. And I think that that's something we can talk about the decision to have them or not in the story, maybe later in the conversation, but we did have access to many of them. Um, we also brought with us as masks. So we would hang out masks if they didn't have one. Um, and that was the way of protecting them and protecting ourselves. And like Trisha said, the fact that we were so close by allow us to drive and come back to our home so we didn't have to stay in hotels and that helped everybody at that time and we we kind of work around the pandemic trying to find these stories and um the best way possible because at the end i think that it was really important to get all the information that was needed even though we were um, going through a public health crisis well the pandemic did help us in in one other way too and that's that Luciana Perez Uribe, who um, was another graduate student and Howard Fellow, uh, was from North Carolina. And so during the pandemic, she went back there to live. And she was on the ground in North Carolina, which helped us with our reporting on seafood processors there. She also yeah. oh, go yeah, ahead. I was gonna say she, yeah, she 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 discovered an outbreak. Mm -hmm. Um that had not been, that we didn't know about um, just by driving, you know, driving to a seafood plant and asking questions. Mm -hmm. And Audit, um, Luciana also worked with you on, on some of the um, data as well, right? She did, yes. Um, and I think she was, um, she was the liaison between um, the data team and the reporting team because she was doing a little bit of both, which, mm -hmm. um, which, which, which really helped the project because she had hands-on experience with the data and she was also on the ground talking to people and interviewing people. So talk about why that's important because it's always a challenge to try to connect the data to the reporting. Um, what, what, and not just with this project, but you've worked on several projects. Um, how do you make sure that, that that connection succeeds? I think that connection is really critical because at the end of the day, the data can only tell you the what, not the why. Um, and every journalistic story is, at the end of the day, a human story. So if you fail to make that human connection with the data set, no matter how rich the data is, um, it's, not, it's not going to be an effective story that may inspire change. Um, so I think that was a critical part of this project. Um, and I think having someone in the team who, um, who was both on the data team and the reporting team um, really made that difference um, because she could, she could analyze the data and go out in the field and do some reporting too. Great. In, in addition to data, we also had records. Um, how important were they? And what was that process like? Because part of this project was, you know, showing the failure at every level of government to, to protect essential workers. And some of, some of the evidence for that was in the records. Can you guys talk about that, how you got them, um, or in some cases didn't, and got around it? Vanessa, I think that once for you and Brittany also was pretty huge in doing that as well. I wish she was here. I, sh I wish she and Luciana were both here. Yeah, yeah so um, one of the things that we did also early on in the process is that we were trying to track down legislation. So we wanted to know, okay, so these workers are being exposed, they're vulnerable for these following reasons, but also what is the state, at the state, what is the state, that, that was the first question, what, what is the state doing to protect them? Before mm -hmm. we ask the federal question, we ask the state question. So we kind of went backwards, I, I, I guess. Um, so we started to look into legislation in Maryland 
And we found that um, the Maryland legislature attempted to pass certain protections and those protections or those um, provisions failed to pass in the committee. So um, we uh, put a, a record request to, to kind of understand the conversation behind those decisions that failed to pass. And then Brittany and Luciana, um, they, and, and then I think that even just the team in, in the rest of the team, the other team, they've mm -hmm. um, put out a lot of record requests to find legislation to see if the departments of health were taking care of these outbreaks, or even if they were aware of these outbreaks uh, in these seafood processing plants. And we found that, for example, in North Carolina, um, even though they knew that uh, these workers were exposed and it was a need for some policy to protect them, they decided not to pass it. Um, and we also found that when workers in Virginia uh, tested positive for COVID when they traveled from Mexico, the Department of Health in Virginia knew about these cases and knew that they were exposed. But also, again, they didn't pass any policy to protect them. And that was the same case in Maryland. And I think that through the record request, we kind of get an insight of what was happening at the policy level. Mm -hmm. And we realized immediately that it was a systematic failure both at the state level, but also at the federal level, because later on, we also knew that the federal level, um, the agency that is in charge of um, putting policies to protect these workers during the transit from Mexico to the US also didn't enforce any um, COVID protections, including asking for a test or a quarantine period once they got here to enter the US. and. That was used in record requests as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So Vanessa, you brought up uh, a minute ago the decisions about who to quote and who not to. Why don't you guys talk about that? Because there were there were lots of discussions. Yeah, so I, I mentioned at the very beginning that we had one worker who was our eyes and ears and who actually made many parts of the story possible. But something that I actually learned from the Howard Center is that you call your sources and then you read the story to them so they can decide if they want to participate. And I remember that even before that, we were concerned that um, even just approaching them was going to put them at risk. But it was really important to understand that and this is something that Deb said in, in the process you've done, disenfranchise them more by deciding on their behalf. You let them decide, you give all the information, you're transparent about who you are, you don't offer anything that you can, you don't offer anything in general. And mm -hmm. then they, you let them decide. So um, with this character who was going to be our lead character in the story, we read the story to her, we share everything and we were completely transparent. And at the, the end, she said, I don't wanna be part of it. So we took her out of the story, but then we were also analyzing the other workers who were also on the record. And um, many of them asked for anonymity. So we granted that anonymity, but also we have photos that we could have used uh, that we got with their consent but I think this was more an, an editorial conversation because it was really clear that had we published all these stories, we would have put them at risk. And we decided, even though um, they gave us consent, we decided not to run those stories. And it was because of, you know, there's one principle that we learn early in when you study journalism or just a, as a journalist, you don't want to cause harm. And that is one of the things that we didn't want to, to be, yeah, to do what, yeah. Um, can I, can I just yeah. make sure that you mention one thing, Vanessa, is kind of, can you talk more about why we also thought it was a reasonable request that we could fulfill to grant them anonymity? Like you and I were talking about this earlier about what the actual consequences could have been for these people. 
Yeah, so I think that the one of the characteristics of this group in particular is that they are vulnerable for, there's one reason that make them vulnerable and it's that their immigration status is um, depend on their employment. So what happens is that if, unlike us, if they complained about lack of safety protections or just safety conditions, they can be fired. And what happens is that if after you are fired, you have a period of two weeks to leave the country because as soon as you lose your job, you are subject to deportation. So um, that is something that maybe many people don't understand unless you are going through that process, what it's like to live with a visa, what it's like to depend on a permission to work, to stay in a place. And for us knowing that, if they get fired, it's not that they can just move to another company and work. They will have to leave the country. And then gaining status, getting back your status is really difficult because just the immigration system is a really difficult system to navigate. And it's even more difficult for somebody who is from another country. And this is something that we understood through the organizers who are advocating for their rights. They explained that it's really difficult for somebody from another country to navigate the system in another country, in another language, um, in a process that takes months, sometimes years, years to navigate. And that is some, just something that uh, we were really conscious and cautious about. And, and that also played a very important role in our decisions not to have them in the stories. And also, I mean, you were somewhat aware of those dynamics as you pitched this idea to look into H2B workers. Like you knew that that could be a huge reason why those complaints were not in our data set in the first place. Because if they were to complain, this entire sequence of events could happen. So I think just, you know, your knowledge about that was something that um, clued us in to why this was important and why it was also underreported. Yeah, and this is something that these organizers have been saying for years. They have been saying there, there needs to be some option for these workers to be able to complain, to be able to move out of these industries and find better conditions without losing their status. So at the very early on the process, we kind of tried to do a lot of pre-reporting and understand the, the characteristics of these communities, and that helped a lot. You also got a really powerful quote from a woman who worked as sort of a middleman um, representing uh, the companies trying to get workers. And you know, one of the things she said, very matter of factly, is if if uh, if a worker complains and loses their job, there are thousands of other people who want those jobs, um, which is yet one more pressure point. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Many of these workers um, come from communities who are already facing economic hardship. So they have a lot to risk. And yeah, it's many people from, because the H2B program is a huge and is expanding. And as, as we say at the end of the, the story, this is a, a program that um, many states and, uh, and industries have been relying on for a very long time, but they want more workers. They want to bring more people. So um, more that means that many more people back in these countries like Mexico or many other Latin American countries are gonna be applying and trying to be one of those who, who get this certification and working, making $7 per hour. Um, you make $7 per hour here, which is impossible to live with, but $7 per hour can be a lot of money in other countries. If you just like put in perspective how much that means. And when they send the money, of course, that, it, that can put food on their table and even help them and their families. So it's, yeah. So for each of you, what, was, what were your biggest takeaways from this project? What did you learn? Um, I can I can go. 
Yeah. Um, I guess, like I mentioned at the beginning of the project, something I hadn't thought about was um, learning about data journalism. Um, I hadn't thought about how how much of an impact could be created by connecting the data story to the human story um, and how that can bring about change. Um, I think that was my biggest takeaway from this um, from this project. And of course, with help from Luciana um, and Vanessa alluded to this earlier too, um, looking at the data to with the lens of, of what's not in it um, seemed to seem to make the story possible, um, which was um, which was another takeaway. Great. Trisha, how about you? I think my biggest takeaway was how to advocate for an idea or for a group of journalists within an organization because talking to Vanessa early on, in the semester when we had started, um, her idea didn't fit the mold exactly of what I think the editors had in mind going in for what this workforce safety violation investigation would be. And talking to Vanessa and seeing that there was so much interest um, in exploring a story or an investigation that had to do with, um, if not unauthorized workers, then at least like migrant workers and immigrants, seeing that there was interest on our team and also knowing that I had been here for a couple of projects, I knew who we needed to talk to in order to get the go ahead um, and kind of connecting new people in the Howard Center to the people that I already knew, I, I felt like I was actually able to leverage what I had learned from previous semesters and just being here in a way that we did something totally new that the Howard Center hadn't, maybe hadn't thought about doing before. Um, and we also, like, as we were doing the new thing, there wasn't really a process for us. I think you know, so we also had, a, it was so much growing in kind of a short amount of time where we were kind of charting new territory within the organization and figuring out like, how do we get, like we were at the beginning, maybe five or six reporters and the other team, like the one that was doing the big investigation that had been planned, which was on Walmart, that team was like more than 20 people, I think. So learning like, okay, like what's feasible for us to do? How can we, you know, largely manage this, you know? And um, how do we also convince our editors to actually publish this story? Because we have to deliver. I think that was just such a, such a growing experience for, for a lot of us, if not all of us on the team. Vanessa, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, it was, I think the biggest takeaway is that you, um, it is important to stay closer to the communities that you want to cover. And I think that the fact that we kind of started from this, from the beginning, we wanted to understand as much as we could about this, this community and this population, their needs and the harm that was being done on them and their pain and everything. Um, gave us access to their lives, to their voices and their stories. And the other thing is that don't let the data trick you because sometimes you might think that because there isn't a database, there isn't a story, but sometimes you can create that database if you don't have one, or you can actually find the stories behind the absence of, or in the absence of data. And that's what we did. And then I think at the end, it just reinforced what I want to do as a journalist, I came with this very raw story idea, feeling a little intimidated, not, not by the team, but just like by the fact of pitching a story. Um, and I think that it was really, really amazing to see this story written and then published. And then the even the fact that we translated the story, so we, we kind of 
expand the access to these stories that both English speakers, but also Spanish speakers could read. That was a huge accomplishment and it was really personal. So uh, every time that I reflect on who I want to be, I go back to this story because I had the chance to explore everything there. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking, and Deb, you can disagree, but I think, you know, one of the things that most impressed me um, was watching all of you um, believe in a story, pitch a story, and then deliver on a story. And that is a skill that no matter what newsroom you end up in, is going to serve you in good stead. Um, you, um, you know, you were willing to, to do the work to convince everyone that, hey, there's a, there's a better story here and we should do it. And so thank you very much for that. Deb, any closing thoughts from you? Um, well, you know, I, I just wanted to reinforce what Audits said. This is a reminder, you know, as we build our data-driven investigative program to always ask that question, who's not in the data? And um, I, I've got to say that um, this has just reinforced the importance of a diverse newsroom. Uh, people who see the world from a, a diversity of perspectives, because we're all prone, you know, to overlook people and problems. We don't mean to, but we don't know where to look for them. We don't know what, you know, rock to pick up and look under. But we, we're all prone to overlook people and problems that aren't part of our experience. Um, and I think this project showed why, uh, you know, when we work, when we're all work together in a diverse newsroom, we can produce great journalism. Yep. I could not agree more. So um, before we open it up for questions, um, just let me brag a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, I started by talking about um, these three are graduate students. Um, next week, they will not be graduate students anymore. They will be graduates and all of them are headed off to amazing things. Trisha is going to go to work for the Associated Press in Minnesota in their State House Bureau. Audit's going to um, go to the Detroit Free Press, um, where he's going to be doing data and data visualizations. Vanessa is um, headed back to the Washington Post um, as an intern for the summer and um, and uh, is in line for um, other jobs as well when that internship is over. So. Um, we're really lucky to have had the chance to work with all three of you. So now, any questions? Katie, are you gonna ask them? Should I do that? Um, it looks like there's one in the Q&A box. Can you see that? Um, the question I, asks, are there any trends in the data? If so, what were those trends? Yeah, um, I, I can I can try answering that. Um, so when we first started looking into um, OSHA complaint, COVID-19 complaint data, um, we were looking into what industries um, those complaints were coming from. And um, one big trend that we noticed was a lot of those complaints were um, coming from big box chains, such as Walmart, um, such as Target. Um, but then when we looked at H2B visa data, um, we realized that seafood packaging um, was, um, was the category that requested the second most number of H2B visas. Um, but then when we looked back into our OSHA complaint data, we realized that um, seafood, seafood processing plants, people there were really not um, um, uh, filing any complaints out of, I think, I believe the number was 65,000 total complaints, um, only about 32 um, complaints were ha had come from um, seafood processing plants. Um, and that's, that was a trend that really inspired this particular story. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. 
I know that there's a class of journalism students who are watching this. So, you know, you guys, this is your time. Okay, well, any, um, any final thoughts from anyone before we wrap up? Stay tuned for the next project that uh, these three have been working on. Another great one. It'll be coming to you uh, in early June. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's one more example of uh, the great work that, um, that they all do. And it's one more example of why I'm so lucky to get to work with Deb every day. All right. Well, with that, thank you for joining us tonight, and, um, and we appreciate it very much. See you later. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. <laughs>